If you are a construction contractor and your laborers are in the habit of making a small fire in the early mornings to keep warm or burn the paper cement bags, if you are a farmer burning fire breaks, a gardener burning refuse, or even just an avid bry master, you'll need to know your responsibilities when it comes to burning, and especially when it just isn't a good idea to burn. Welcome, my name is Sean McGregor of Ecoligus Environmental Consultants based in Mpumalanga, South Africa and we're on a mission to empower all South Africans to protect their environment through the correct interpretation and application of our environmental legislation. So if you want to learn how our environmental law applies to you and how to avoid unnecessary and costly mistakes or if you just want to increase your knowledge and skills to reduce your reliance on external consultants then you'll want to subscribe to this channel. Don't forget to click on the bell notification icon so that you can be notified the moment we upload a new video. And if you do know of anyone else who can benefit from these videos, please like them. It will help spread the message. Thank you. So let's get started. The title of this video is When Not to Burn. Because burning has so many different applications, there is quite a range of legislation regulating burning, from local municipal bylaws to NIMACWA, the National Environmental Management Air Quality Act, to CARA, the Conservation of Agricultural Resources Act, and probably the most important is the National Felt and Forest Fires Act. We are going to start with the National Felt and Forest Fires Act, Act Number 101 of 1998, because it contains a section all about open air fires, which is applicable to absolutely everyone. And I want to highlight four of the prohibitions contained in that act. Firstly, if a fire that you either start, use or maintain, now I want to digress a little bit, it's very important. You don't have to start a fire to be responsible for it. If you simply stood next to it to keep warm, or if you contributed fuel to it by adding a log to keep it going, you have now claimed responsibility for that fire. So let me start again. If you have a fire that you either started, used or maintained, um, which spreads and causes injury or damage, then you commit an offense. If you throw a burning match or any other burning material into the felt, for example, which makes a fire that spreads and causes injury or damage, then you commit an offence. If you start, use or maintain a fire in a road reserve, other than in a fireplace designated by a competent authority, then you commit an offence. And this last one I find very interesting. If you simply leave a fire that you started, used or maintained unattended before it has been ex extinguished, then you commit an offence. And that places a big responsibility on absolutely anyone and everyone using a fire. Now farmers use fire as a tool to manage their felt, particularly in cases where it has become moribund or overgrown with dead material. It tends to suffocate the plant, resulting in a loss of production, etc. Now, in terms of the amended regulations published under CARA, Act Number 43 of 1983, a land user may not burn the felt on his or her farm or even utilize that burnt felt as grazing except on authority of a written permission by the executive officer. And again, in terms of those same amended regulations, an application uh, must be submitted to the executive officer at least 30 days before the intended date of burning or grazing. Now, Sanby has actually published a wonderful guideline document, not just for farmers, but also agricultural extension staff for implementing grazing and burning best practice principles that will not only conserve grassland biodiversity, but also support um, economically viable and sustainable livestock production. I'll include a link to that document in the description below. It's called Grazing and burning guidelines, managing grasslands for biodiversity and livestock production. It was published in 2014. Apart from using fire to manage the felt, farmers also need to burn fire breaks. The National Felt and Forest Fires Act places a burden on every landowner or person owning land on which a felt fire may start, may burn, or from which it may spread to prepare and maintain fire breaks. 
The Act doesn't set out dimensions for the fire brakes, but it does prescribe three other important things. Firstly, it has to be wide enough. Secondly, it must not cause soil erosion. And unfortunately, I've seen a lot of fire breaks or particularly tracer lines that have been sprayed with chemicals eroded right down to bedrock, in which case the landowners or farmers simply translocate the fire break elsewhere, leaving those heavily degraded or burnt, um, sorry, disturbed sites. Then the third requirement is the fire break must be reasonably free of any inflammable material that is capable of carrying a fire across it. Before a person goes ahead with preparing and maintaining a fire break by burning it, he or she must determine a mutually agreeable date with the landowners of adjoining properties and inform the Fire Protection Association if there is any in your area. If it is not possible to come to a mutually agreeable date on which to burn, let's say you have many uh, landowners or adjoining properties, then you must at the very least inform those landowners um, in writing 14 days in advance of burning. Okay, if you don't, then it's considered a crime. And that's it uh, regarding fire breaks and the National Fault and Forest Fires Act. But before I leave that act, I want to drop a little bombshell. Um, it's something I stumbled across when reading through it, and it is found in section 16. It links quite nicely to a previous video we did on protected plant permitting. Now, in terms of section 16, a person's right or duty to prepare and maintain fire breaks prevails over any prohibition in any other law on the cutting, disturbance, damaging, destruction or removal of any plant or tree. Okay, except, except that the landowner must um, either if possible transplant the protected plant or if it's feasible and safe to do so then uh, translocate, uh, move the fire break to avoid the protected plant or tree. Okay, so that's just an interesting exemption regarding protected plant permitting, but I do recommend you consulting the case officer responsible for either permitting or licensing, whether it be under NEMBA, NFA, or a provincial ordinance um, in your area, before simply taking this exemption uh, for granted. Burning waste is another relevant subject I just want to touch on briefly and it is regulated both locally and nationally. Nationally it would fall under NEMACWA or the National Environmental Management Air Quality Act and locally it would be a municipal bylaw. Some municipal bylaws, for example, require a resident or residents to obtain permits from fire department officials prior to the burning of their garden refuse. Other municipal bylaws prohibit the burning of waste if its purpose is for disposal entirely. So you'll need to obtain and then familiarize yourself with the local bylaws for your municipality or area. Irrespective though, and considering that burning pumps pollutants into the atmosphere, we do encourage you to investigate other alternatives for managing your waste uh, before resorting to either burning or disposing at the municipal dump site. And I'm reminded of the R's. The first R would be to refuse. Um, I've also heard the term avoid being used. You know, for example, if you go to the shops, don't take a plastic bag from the lady at the till. Either use your arms or take your own cloth bag, for example. So you can refuse to generate waste. Next down the tier, or the next best option, would be to um, reduce the amount of waste that you generate. Third would be to reuse it or repurpose it, and the fourth would be to recycle. So just consider those alternatives uh, once again before resorting to burning. Irrespective of whether you are a contractor managing his or her staff on a construction site, a farmer burning fire breaks or burning their felt to manage it ecologically, a bry master, or just a gardener burning garden refuse, you are going to need to know when you cannot burn. I know I mentioned earlier that I had wrapped up the National Felt and Forest Fires Act, but I was mistaken. I'm going to use that act as the coup de grace in this concluding section of our video. Now, the National Felt and Forest Fires Act provides for various methods and practices to prevent and combat felt, forest and mountain fires. One such method is the fire danger rating. The fire danger rating is calculated using several local factors from topography to vegetation and weather and it's a measure of the chance or the risk of a fire from occurring or getting out of control. 
Now this whole system has been set up and is maintained by the Minister in consultation with the South African Weather Bureau and Fire Protection Associations. Now this is the important part. Warnings of felt fire conditions, that is when the FDI or Fire Danger Index exceeds 75 or is termed extremely dangerous, are published on the Weather Bureau's website. That is www.weathersa.co.za. Now it is a criminal offence to start, use or maintain an open fire in any region that has been identified in that warning. That warning will also usually prescri it will prescribe the period during which the prohibition applies. Okay, you got it. Well that's it. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope this was helpful. And thank you so much for watching. If you have joined the MP or in Corsi tiers of our membership program, then you will receive an additional video. I actually go through the step-by-step -step process for finding the FDI on the department's website. And we touch on NEM ACRA, the National Environmental Management Air Quality Act, to find out if it applies to you, particularly if you are burning waste, operating a charcoal production plant, or even a combustion appliance like a fuel-fired boiler. If you aren't a member yet, then check out our membership program on Patreon. Otherwise, if you're simply looking for a consultant to help you with the once-off project, you're welcome to visit our website. I do recommend that you check out our previous video, um, The Hidden Trap of Phase Activities. It's, it's really pretty important. You can't afford to miss that. And the next one looks at, we explore the legislation governing noise. It's entitled, When is Noise Too Loud? Otherwise, subscribe, click on the bell notification icon, and please like the video if you know of someone who can benefit from it. It'll just help spread the message. Thank you so much for your support. Keep strong, and God bless.